politicize that agenda amongst your own people. In other words, make others also aware of it, whether on the left or on the right, make them aware of it so that they know that you're, the king is in residence. Nobody builds towards an end. Everybody builds themselves. We are now stuck in Genesis 11. Let us build for ourselves. Chapter 19, there was a statement that says, we will not have this man rule over us. And then the, Jesus gave the uh, part of a parable and each one that took theirs and came back, they doubled it, but he gave them cities. Thank you for not lording over us. Thank you that you didn't come in with a title and you made us. Hello and welcome to Unlock the Kingdom Within You. This podcast explores the profound truth about what it means to be born into the kingdom, not a religion. On this podcast, we challenge the religious and denominational norms which shackle us from expressing the liberty of Christ by exploring the kingdom, the ecclesia, and citizenship. If you're born into the kingdom but lost in religion, then this channel is just for you. So thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. I, I think that that is an important point because it leads on to the next question, which is about understanding the relationship between authority and governance. And I think that's a crucial one because often governance... Government tends to often, um, well, well, I should say this, when we're living in societies that have moved away from monarchies somewhat um, and have moved towards um, sort of more democratic, oligarchical based societies, there is always a tension between who's ruling and who's actually ruling. It's this sense of who's leading and who's ruling. And so there's a tension there. I don't think that we have really clearly fleshed out the relationship between the Godhead and the Godhead's government, which is essentially manifested within the ecclesia. Um, so sometimes, I'm going to bring David on this, so sometimes I think that what ends up happening, and um, we see it especially when, um, I should say like this, ministers turn functional roles into title-based roles, is we see a change in scope where they become the authorities rather than the functional ministers who are there to help regulate the authority's mandate. And this is where we start to see lines being blurred and we start to see subjugation put in, in place in our communities. So David, did you want to just come in on that sort of uh, distinguishing, what you'd say is, a, is the, the slight difference or variation between when we talk about authority, you talked about the Godhead and, and the governments that the Godhead forms, which are essentially the delegation of the gifts and the offices to men, in yeah. order to take the society forward? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, one thing we can't lose uh, sight or ever forget is when God created man, Adam, and then gave him the woman who later was called Eve, he gave them dominion, just like Tim said a while ago, dominion. But look, and I'm going to read just exactly how the verse says what they had dominion over. It says, and subdue it, this is dominion, and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, in the beginning, in God's eternal purpose, he tells this man that he has created, and this woman, you're going to have dominion over the fish, you're going to have authority, I'm going to give you this delegated authority, so that you can establish my authority on this earth over the fish, over the creeping things, over the beast of the field. Notice what was left out or who was left out. God did not tell man to govern another man. He did not tell Adam to govern people. That's right. Yet, mm. here's what happened. Going back to what Tim said, and I'm going to get to answer the question. This, this leads right into it. Is this when man fell off the purpose and he disobeyed and separated himself from God, he became spiritually dead, separated from God. Then he took it on himself to use an illegitimate authority and he began to govern man instead of governing the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creeping thing. He shifted 
because of being separated from God and no longer having God's theocracy, no longer being under God's government. He was separated from it. So now he went on his own and established his own government. And the first thing he did is he started, and we begin to see it in scripture, man started governing man. And this is where the problem has began. And this is where the problem is a big problem today. The theocracy of God and the plan of redemption is to reconcile man back to God so that now man is again governed by the king and the lordship of the Godhead, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. So redemption comes to reconcile man. See, the problem with religion and evangelical preaching is that they preach salvation as an escape from earth to go to heaven. But the whole purpose of redemption at the cross is to reconcile man who has been separated from God and from his theocracy. And now in redemption, we are reconciled so that now Christ is our King and Lord, and now we are under the theocracy of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because all three are together united to govern. And now man, once again, has authority just like Adam did. But here's the important part, and this is where the church and the modern movements in the last decades have totally gone bunkers and way off course. They've not understood that man is under the authority of the theocracy of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How did that translate in practical words? I, the moment I became born again and I was redeemed from the curse of death, from the curse of eternal separation, and I was reconciled to God, in that instant, in that instant, I came under the theocracy of the Godhead. And now I, the born-again David Castro, I'm here to every day have a desire to do the will of the Father of the Godhead, under the kingship and lordship of the Son of the Godhead, led by the Holy Spirit of the Godhead. All three in one accord about the government, the order, and the theocracy that is going to govern me. And then what is my responsibility now? I have a calling. I have a gift that God gives me. So I am now to help my fellow man my brother and my sister, to help them come under the same theocracy. I'm not here. God hasn't delegated me to now tell Tim or tell you, Fred, or anyone else, well, you know, I'm an apostle, so I've got this fivefold office, and now you got to submit to me, and you got to submit to reading only my books, and you got to submit to what I say and do and how I pray, and you got to give me your tithe and you got to give me your offerings and you got to do that. And all this nonsense, this manipulation, this manipulation of what, what Tim was talking about dominance and, and this has perverted it. God, it, it, what is done is usurp the Godhead. It's taken the will of the father out, the Lordship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Christ as head over my life and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. People talk about the Spirit-filled life. The Spirit-filled life is being led by the Spirit, not by the apostle. If I have an apostolic gifting, then my apostolic gifting is not to lord people, but is to help people come under the theocracy of God, come under the order of the Godhead. But unfortunately, what has happened with all these gifts and the fivefolds, or take it out of the context of the fivefold, denominations. You have these solo pastoral ministries where there's a pastor and his wife, and they run this huge mega congregation. They're the kingpin. They're, they're, they're sitting on, everybody submits, everybody bows, everybody, when he says jump, everybody says how high. They're usurping 
the Godhead and you're not allowing the Godhead to function in the organism of the theocracy of God. Another thought that I will submit in this conversation is this. The purpose of government is to protect and to preserve and to advance the purpose of that government. So God's kingdom has a theocracy. The purpose of the theocracy of God with the Godhead is to protect and to preserve. Who are they going to protect and preserve? You and I, the ecclesia, the the citizens of that kingdom the nation of that kingdom. So my protection doesn't come from some man on earth, doesn't come from some apostolic network that I signed the contract to. It doesn't come from the council or the headquarters of the denomination, wherever it may be. No, my protection comes from the Godhead and from the theocracy of God. Then it preserves me. How does it preserve me? with the principles and the spiritual truth and the spiritual laws of the government of God, the constitution. That's how it preserves me. And then through the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, I am led to advance the purpose for which I was created. That is the Godhead cooperating with the theocracy of God, advancing the eternal purpose of God. What church And all the stuff that we got around the world today has done is completely usurped, come as a a blocking and a hindrance and a dam to hold up the process and the flow of the organism of the theocracy of God. I think one of the crucial things I think is, is that the current infrastructure within our existing communities, namely church and denominationalism, I think does not the, the the governing role is to preserve what is this the social norm and the contracts that exist within it rather than to seek the desire of, of Christ's dominion which should be then reflected amongst the citizens and I liken it to even some of our existing political institutions and I want to touch on that a little bit and go back to Charles on this this is idea that you know within this country within the UK, Uh, We're in a a democratic state, but the reality is our vote is not worth that much. And I think people are waking up to that more and more. They're beginning to realize that we've had cycles and cycles of, of, of a failed government, which consists of people who really don't know how to rule. They're elite, but they really don't know how to rule, or they rule according to their own interests. And this is what Charles initially pointed to. And I think there's a waking up within the context amongst God's people to actually realize that a true theocratic state would work in such a way that its citizens become even more empowered to be in governance, not less empowered. You know, you often hear people today, even within our current society, that when there's an issue, they say, what is the government doing about it? This is, we go back to this outsourcing. We talk about outsourcing education, but the same thing, we've outsourced government. In other words, if there's a problem, somebody else needs to fix it. And I think one of the things about the ecclesia and the spirit of it is it actually recognizes the citizens within it recognize that they are there to repair the breach. They are there to bring about change in order to reestablish and rebuild society. And so it comes down to each citizen to take that responsibility and work together for that, for that towards that purpose. So last thing I wanted to say as well, which I thought was interesting, and Charles, you touched on it, was this idea of how Christendom, uh, how the Christians in Christendom tend to view politics. Politics is just simply the process of decision making. That's all that politics is in, in, in its very simple skeletal form. And I think that often what happens is people don't realize we are making decisions every day. So we're being political in our decisions. So when we talk about the kingdom, and we talk about the agenda of our God and our King, it's where we're saying, in fact, when I see, when Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom, I I see that very much as a statement that says, make the politics of the kingdom your priority. Make the concerns about the kingdom, the agenda of the kingdom your priority, and politicize that priority amongst your own people. Politicize that agenda amongst your own people. In other words, 
make others also aware of it, whether on the left or on the right, make them aware of it so that they know that your, the king is in residence. Charles, I just wanted to throw that back to you. Designed by Citizens for Citizens, the Nation Builders app is designed for you to get involved with building the society Jesus had in mind. The app is built upon four principles, connect, communicate, community and collaborate. Connect through your very own digital profile, share your thoughts and ideas through engaging posts, videos and events. Communicate, develop long lasting friendships with fellow citizens through your own personal inbox. Receive real time alerts on new comments, messages, likes and friend requests. Community. Our open door policy means you can connect with online communities and special interest groups to fellowship together. Collaborate. Our civic spaces focus on cultivating the civic life of citizens through community, education, governance and enterprise. Don't delay. Sign up for free now at www.nationbuilders.community or download our free Nation Builders app on Play Store. Excellent. You know, the, the same concept, you use the word politics. And like we said earlier, that a lot of people might not connect it. Yet the word politics, yes, politicals, which comes from the Greek term politicals, comes from the root term polis, which is basically a city. City, yeah. Metropolis. So politicals was simply how to administrate the city, how to make things work, how to make life functional for everybody. So that already tells the many listeners right now that half the politicians you know are not politicians. Mm -hmm. Straight. Because they have no clue how to make the city work, no yeah, clue. Right, right. Their, 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 right. their job primarily, and then in a democratic structure like for Kenya, which borrows off of a lot of the uh, other democratic, we, we are like an amalgamation, Western, Western. A, a Frankenstein of Western uh, mm -hmm. democracies and republics and federal states. It's a really a mix. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is people are more towards protecting the party than the people. It's running for your party, whatever your yes. party wants, not what the people want. So it's an entirely different ballgame. And you, you get people on your team to rubber stamp your ideas. And while that party primarily has owners, it pretends to be a party, but it, it, it sometimes represents an olig oligarchy, a group mm -hmm. of people hiding behind a party to pretend to be part of this. And they'll use whatever means necessary. Like in Kenya, they use the church as a rubber stamp. And I mean, many other countries, it just depends on where you are. That's and everywhere. So in, yeah, in the That's end, we, we lose the complete reality. We lost the idea of a city state. Nobody builds towards an end. Everybody builds themselves. We are now stuck in Genesis 11. Let us build for ourselves. Nobody wants to build what God wants to build. And, and Charles, so, sorry, can yeah. I just come in on that a second? I think yes. one thing I wanted just to pull out there is, is the fact that often when it comes to church and state, the, the church made a decision progressively a long time ago to not be in politics, not be involved in the, in the real issues of society mm. and decided that they were going to be, they were going to create a moral hegemony around what they think are the standards of society. And I think that that's, that's where the problem is. You mm. cannot talk about standards in society if you're not involved in the dynamics of society. Yeah. And so that's where we now have a situation today within Christendom where some people say, well, church and state should be separate. But what you're not realizing is, is you're essentially um, omitting responsibility for being involved within what society should look like, which is what's the what citizenship is premised on. And as a result, you're setting yourself up to be some sort of religious hierarchy that ultimately will become a bad spell amongst the citizenry around you. I hope that makes sense, Charles. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I can put it this way. Um, when we look at the Old Testament and we talk about the whole law, all right, when, when God would say things like, if you keep the whole law, we now know that the law was broken into three components. There was the moral law, there was a the ceremonial law, and the civil law. And we are well aware that the moral law was eternal. It doesn't change. We don't even debate it. We know thou shalt not kill is thou shalt not kill, irrelevant of where we go. The ceremonial law was what ended at the cross. But the church revamped it, dusted it off, dressed it up afresh, and right. put it into the system. And then the civil law, which we should have kept, which would have helped us 
developed politics, we then abolished because we were going to live in heaven. Or we so gave we it to this, the state and we gave it to the state. Yes, we gave it to the state. We said, the state, you take the civil law. We'll keep the ceremonial law. We'll create a government for the ceremonial law. And then we'll control people within that context because it doesn't matter. Our laws will only work in heaven anyway. We don't need them to work <laughs> here. And then suddenly the, 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 the extension continues and heaven doesn't show up and then we are stuck. And, and I believe that's really the scenario where the separation has come from because now we are incompetent. We've not been training anybody for civil law. And, 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 and if they do, we, we, we are interesting. We behave like the Assyrians and the Egyptians and everybody else. We take captives. So if, if you're a lawyer, we capture you and make you an usher. Yeah, Just to yeah. make sure you, you take away your, your civil abilities. And this is how we've been running. So suddenly when government governance shows up, we end up with that crazy model because then everybody must now bow down to the titular, not functional authority. Yes. The yeah. titular authority that we've created. And that's where the fivefold problem came from, which I remember the earlier question that was asked. Our, our fivefold in the church is titular, yet the fivefold of the kingdom is functional. Yes. So yes. Yeah. So we don't even need to give the title if you're functioning. I, I don't see us calling a singer singer. Mm. We just tell them to sing because mm. they function in that way. But in the church, because of ceremony, because we have to create an illusionary god. We have to create this, this unreachable position. Then we must create titles to protect him. Yeah. You know, because, mm -hmm. and he lives in a house and somebody's a custodian of the house. But when we get to governance and politics, we have to get out of the house and begin to function and then we are lost. So I yeah. think that's where the problem comes from. Absolutely. We've only got a few more minutes. Um, Can I? And, I'm, and I'm conscious we've got to go into the Q&A. Um, okay. But Tim, if, before you come in, I would like us to at least... If when you do come in, Tim, just bring in the importance of the of what I think is a, a really a key element of governance manifested is this idea of the clarity of eldership, which I think is a really crucial layer within the context of expressing the kingdom as well as galvanizing and supporting citizens. So, Tim, if you could bring a little bit of that in while, while you're going to respond. Okay, uh, the plurality is is a is a the model that you see from the very beginning. Uh, when elders first were uh, introduced, uh, it was always a plurality. Even when we see the what we have fallen into, the I call them religious icons, when we see David and we see Moses, you see them even working in context of the elders. You know, uh, they had the, the vision of, of the father, but they definitely, there were always the elders around them. And I think that's a uh, a pattern that has remained throughout scripture. And when we got to the New Testament, uh, as we call it, New Testament, that pattern never changed. The plurality uh, of elders uh, became this uh, way of, of, of governing local uh, cities, congregations, whatever. It, they, they, were doing the, they were doing that all the way throughout the New Testament. And I think that's a, a, is critical for us today. Uh, just so I'll throw this out right now. Uh, David mentioned the solo pastora, you know, for years, we, my wife and I started a, a work uh, 30 some odd years ago. And that was the model that I understood, you know, to be the senior pastor, to be all of this. Well, recognizing that there is a need uh, and, and actually the, the I would almost stop, stop short of calling it a mandate of the plurality. Uh, we I have stepped back and and, and have been now building the plurality within our fellowship you know in other words uh i can't be the big guy at the top you know who they who you cater to or have or, or who have all the answers you know because under that old system it comes we can't breathe unless what does pastor say you know does pastor say it's okay for us to walk out the house is it you know what does pastor say about this no i have to step back and that was a that was actually a training point for me I don't want to use up a lot of time because I had to learn what it meant to allow to step back and allow the plurality to begin to take uh, the authority that, that that they should be walking in. That is a, a proposition for any pastor who might be listening. You know, that's not an easy thing just to say, OK, one day I'm going to have to submit to the, this plurality. And, and suddenly you find yourself 
under uh, moving into more of an a clearer role of a, a function of what God has called you to, rather than being this headship who had to answer ask for answer for everything that's going on in the fellowship. So that's that's the free part. I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, right. And I, what I was gonna get into before that was uh, Luke chapter 19, but we don't have. I don't think we'll have time for that. That was time. very interesting. That was in chapter 19. There was a statement that says, "We will not have this man rule over us." And then the, Jesus gave the uh, part of a parable. And each one that took theirs and came back, they doubled it, but he gave them cities. I thought that was very unique. Uh, mm. He didn't come back and say, I, you know, I give you, you know, whatever. He said, he said you, you trade it, and now you have doubled it. I give you 10 cities. I give you five cities. I give you, and the one who messed up, you know, uh, lost his, his, his authority in that realm. So, uh, don't have time for that, but I think that's a, a that's discussion a really, for another really time. Cool. Thank you for joining our fireside talk about the kingdom. My name is Frederick Tobin, and I hope this podcast has been a blessing to you. If you'd like to continue to receive fresh insight into the kingdom, click the notification bell to follow us. For further information about the kingdom, visit our website, www.unlockthekingdomwithinyou.com, to download your free ebook. See you soon.